Thank you so much for joining me this morning. I hope you have, a, have had a great NDC. Finally, real conferences with real people, which is also interesting because it's been a while, at least for me. I want to start out with a joke. Don't get your hopes up too much, though, because it's pretty bad and it's kind of old. But here goes. So there was this person who went to the doctor complaining that their arm hurts when they move like this. The doctor's response? Don't move it like that. Yeah, you know the one. <laughs> but the funny thing is, that pretty much thumbs up how Apple responded. There we go. How Apple responded when people complained about the iPhone for signal degradation. Because if you breach the little gap down here with your thumb, you lost coverage. And if you look here, allegedly, there was a person who emailed Apple, and, and Gadget was kind enough to publish it so we can ridicule it. But look down here. Just avoid holding it in that way. Same thing. Bad joke. For me, to even suggest that it's the user's fault? I hold my phone how I would, right? No, that's just horrible. Don't do that. It's not the user's fault. But it makes me think about a principle, the principle of least astonishment. If a necessary feature has a high astonishment factor, it may be necessary to redesign that factor or that, that feature. Meaning that our things, our apps, our webs should behave in a way that the user expects without astonishment or surprises. My name is Jessica Engstrom. I am a Windows developer MVP, and I've been teaching UX for developers around 10 years now. Together with my husband, who's actually in the audience today, uh, we run a podcast, a stream, a user group, all tech stuff, developer things. So if you're into that sort of thing, come join us. We have a lot of fun. Today, I will give you a couple of examples of more practical um, ways to improve your UX, and I will also give you the three most common accessibility issues and how to fix them. But first, let's talk about UI and UX, because there is a lot of confusion and misconceptions out there. You've probably seen images similar to this one, like we have the glass bottle, the classical ketchup glass bottle uh, representing UI, UI, and then we have the plastic squeezy bottle, which in theory is easier, representing UX. Or even the glass bottle as before UX and the plastic squeezy bottle as after UX. And one of my favorite things to, well, it gets on my nerves sometimes, when you have a kind of plain design and you show before UX and then you have like a colorful, more attractive looking design as the after UX. UX isn't pixie dust. You can't just like sprinkle it on everything and everything will work for everyone. I see it like this. Both of them, there we go, both of them has a UI. And all of them has a UX. How we actually use the product. So what I'm trying to say here is, you see, this is a plastic squeezy bottle. This person is not having a good user experience with it, even if it's usually depicted as after UX. So regardless if it's a good experience or a bad experience, it's equally as much an experience we're having. I do like when we're trying to include as many people as possible. So this is my absolute all-time favorite ketchup package because this caters to those who wants to dip their fries and those who wants to squeeze it all over or whatever you have your I don't know, do you have ketchup on fries here? Yeah, there you go. As humans, we do have some limitations. Our sight is limited, our attention is limited, our um, memory is limited just to scratch the surface. So thank you, brain. But if we design with these limitations in mind, the users will 
benefit greatly. They will perceive our applications as faster, more intuitive, easier, and even more attractive looking without changing any color schemes and stuff like that. So that's pretty powerful. In psychology, there's something called uh, cognitive load, which I usually compare to um, our laptops, for instance, the CPU, the processor. If we run two, three instances of Visual Studio, it will get slower. It will be less responsive. Same goes for our brain. If we have conflicting information, if we have too much information, if we have distractions, we will get slower and less responsive. That's just how it works. So if we overload the user with too many options or unnecessary steps, we will derail the user's train of thought. They will get a little bit slower. They might even get irritated. I'm one of those. I'm a rage quitter. It's, I'll, I'll be upfront with you, that's me. And I will show you my favorite unnecessary step at the end. Um, I love to hate that. So I will come back to that. I probably shouldn't use favorite in the same sentence as a bad UX experience, should I? You'll see what I mean if you stick around. But let's take this number as an example. 16 numbers. There's no way I will remember this. Well, I could if I really worked on it, but probably not just by looking at it like this. But if we split it up and reduce that cognitive load, we have four sets of four numbers. All of a sudden, I can remember this, which may or may not be a good thing because credit cards and debit cards have the same thing. I all of a sudden remember, so I can shop a lot more. So. Credit and debit cards are a very good example of how to reduce that cognitive load. But the same is true for our um, applications, our software. We can do that there as well. So let's take a more practical example and start with something that we all come in contact with. Uh, I think most of you have a love-hate relationship with forms. Either we have to do them or we have to fill them in, or both. So. Here we have it, a form. Nothing suspicious about it at all. Regular form, it's even aligned, which we approve. However, we have 32 visual fixations going on here. That's 32 places where the users need to stop, focus, read, move on, stop, focus, read, move on, and so on. So by simply moving our labels on top of our input boxes, we will reduce the number of visual fixations by almost half. We're down to 18 now, because now they're a group, they're a set, um, they make sense together, so we, are, we can group them in our head. One thing that I do want you to take away is do not use templates blindly. Instead, take a step back and think about what is it that I really need to ask for? Um, it's, you know that habit, you just grab the latest one you did and you work from there and you add stuff and you forgot to remove a bunch of stuff. So if I sign up for a blog newsletter, is it relevant data what gender I identify with? I think not. I will also remove age range because we are a little bit further down asking for the date of birth. So we can figure that out. Also marital status, are we still asking for that? Feels kind of old fashioned to me. And while we're at it, let's also change the date of birth from three input box boxes or drop down boxes, I should say, into one input box. Here is a, there is a caveat here though. And I'm of course talking about if you're not uh, using a uh, date picker in this um, instance. I, I do know there's awesome date pickers out there. Please use them if you can, but if you cannot, that uh, I uh, did want to include this anyway. So let's get back to that caveat in a minute. I've also simplified uh, first name, last name into one full name on top here as well. A 
we've removed a lot we didn't need. However, we kind of go, got a lot of zigzag going on here because we read in that pattern in the Western world from left to right, top to bottom. Of course, we can just swoop it into one single line. We're down to nine visual fixations. Now, if you are very observant or a fast counter, you may or may not notice that there's only eight on screen. And I did say nine. Because the other one, the ninth one, did not fit the screen. So here we have two choices. Either we take a step back and we try to figure out, do we really need to ask for the shipping address at this stage? Or can we do that uh, a little later when we're actually shipping the things? But for the sake of this talk, let's say we do need to ask for it. Split it up into multiple pages. Because again, going back to the credit and debit cards, it is so much easier to consume small parts of stuff, in this case, uh, form pages, than it is that one humongous one. Even if it's the same amount of data, it will feel so much better. Being upfront with the user is also uh, quite powerful because, um, well, being upfront with how much is left, I should say, of the form, because it can actually stress people out. And it's shown that it will lower both anxiety and um, stress levels if we are upfront, they know exactly how much is left. So using some sort of progress indicator is a really good way to reduce that. And of course, there is that added benefit that they will feel like they can trust us a little bit more because we are honest about there's actually 500 pages to this. We were upfront with that. And one of, my, one of my absolute favorite things here is, you see, we haven't started to fill this out, but I, had, I have a little head start on the actual progress indicator because this trick will increase the number of people who actually fills out the form, like significantly. Because we all strive for that dopamine, like the achievement dopamine. We want to succeed. The step is almost done. We already got a point for free, so let's do it. So that's kind of powerful. Let's also put a button right down in the line of sight to the left. Because if we put it to the right, and we are using some sort of screen enlargement tool, kind of hard to see that there's a button there. So left side, Western world, a little bit better. But let's talk about the button. What does continue mean? You know those buttons that says yes, no, maybe, but they didn't really ask a question? Yeah. Is it continue with the next step? Is it continue with my sign up? I don't know. Ash talked about this in, her, in, in their amazing talk yesterday. So if you by any chance missed that, do go and see it on YouTube afterwards. Um, they had really good examples of the yes, no buttons as well. So I will actually change this to next step. But again, I need to be upfront with you so we can have that trust here. Continue would probably suffice if we are using a progress bar. But I think it's better to always think about the clarity of what we're putting on our buttons. Uh, so it's better to be overly clear than risk forgetting it somewhere else. Helping the users with smart defaults so the user doesn't have to think about how or why or what format we want their data in is also really helpful for making people actually fill them out. Uh, especially so when it comes to dates. And we talked about the caveat, here, here it is. If you are going to use a single input for dates, make sure that you are very clear on what format we are going to put that in. Of course, it's very important that you're clear in all the inputs, but especially so if you have uh, international users. Because I know we can find out what operating system language we're using, what region we're in, what language we're 
our devices is set to and set to and so on. However, I have all my operating systems in English, and some of my devices are region Sweden, some are not. So I would be one of those who got the wrong number sometime. Letting the user know that they have succeeded is also um, a good thing. So in this case, we have put a green frame around the input box. However, to be more accessible, we need to use a symbol for this as well. Do not ever solely rely on colors to portray something uh, that is important. Another great tool is to mark the active input box. In this case, I am using a blue, uh, double this, the thickness frame around the input box. I'm not using a symbol because it is uh, a little bit, it does differentiate because it's a little bit wider and also it's not a crucial, it's not crucial that we know exactly where we are if we were to miss this, if we have bad screens or can't see color uh, like most people. Uh, so it's still visible for everyone. Displays the errors before the user submits their form. And please, please, I beg of you, not in a long list down below, out of context, so we don't know exactly where the errors are. We will lose the context. Um, and again, we have a red frame, and we do have a symbol here as well. Never blame the user by saying they put in the wrong format or they failed or something like that. Be as clear as possible and think for the user. Like you see here, I'm saying wrong format. Well, that's not good. Let's change that to please enter the date of birth in this format. Because otherwise, if I've already messed things up and I don't get the smart defaults anymore, I'm, I don't know how to fill that in, so. Now we know exactly what we want. So with just a few steps, we went from this to this. And here you can see another example of uh, naming your buttons. I've called this create your account instead of continue because there is a difference here. So there are, of course, still things we can improve upon when it comes to forms, uh, but I would say if we do this, we have come a long way. But we can also uh, improve upon always having a way for the user to opt out and quit uh, at any time. Uh, always have a way to go back in the UI if um, maybe the user figures out halfway through that, oh, I shouldn't have used my work email or something like that, so we don't lose all that data. And always use contrasting input boxes. Uh, in this case, we're using a white input box on a gray background. This will benefit not only the users greatly, but also us, because we will get relevant data, so we don't have to parse through all that fluff that we didn't need, and we will get more people actually submitting, so that's, um, that's always good. We wanted the data, right? So we all want our users to navigate through our, our softwares with ease. And that means we need to reduce something called interference. Now, if you are a cat person or has ever had a cat, I see some laughing going on here, you know that if you have a keyboard or even better, a laptop, the cat will be an interference because warm and cozy in, in, their, in their way. So if things are arranged in a way that the hierarchy is clear, that we understand that, it will be so much easier for the user to understand, to not have to think about what's the most important thing on the page and so on. You've probably seen examples like this. I don't have any problem reading this, uh, the written color, when it is colored either congruent and or uh, in a neutral color like this. But when we mix it up, it gets a little bit harder. I mean, we can read it. It's just 
a little bit harder. We get that interference. Not as effective. This is also interference. You know, I put this in here. I know that the red one says, says go. I was going to say stop here. <laughs> There's like a few hundred milliseconds every time I see this. I still read stop on the red one. Because in the Western world, we're trained that red is stop and green is go. Makes sense. So that's also slight conflict. Of course, being a Swede, I need to take you to Ikea. So welcome to Ikea in Stockholm. Notice the gate. Oh gosh, the color is blown out by the purple lights. Okay, you have to trust me on this one. There's gates, they say in. Those are green in the real world. Uh, there's also uh, other ones that says out, but in Swedish, they are blue. Clearly, I should go in through the indoors, that's also green. Kind of awesome. I know exactly what gates to use. And I don't know how it is here or wherever you're from, but in Sweden, those kinds of gates have multiplied like, I don't know, like triples uh, lately. Because during the pandemic, we did not close down our grocery shops, but they did try to elevate uh, safety. So they didn't want us to stand in line. So they built a lot of self-checkout um, areas. And those are usually using gates like this. Now, the good thing with these gates is that as a shop, you can decide on the etching on it. It can set in, it can say, it can be a logo, whatever you want, and you can choose the color. Really good for branding. Or is it? So I present to you the Swedish, a Swedish, very large Swedish chain of stores, uh, grocery stores. Now this is a picture from a close by shop. Uh, yeah, you can kind of hint that it's red here. It's their logo, it's red. It's not the shop I go to daily, but I've been here maybe 25 times. I kid you not, every single time. I'm like, do, 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 do. Uh, that's the out exit, okay. No, right, ah, oh, I should go in here every single time. I feel a little bit stupid doing so as well because I know very well that their logo is red, but my brain does not for a few hundred milliseconds. So definitely a slight conflict here. So giving the users clear information and also good error messages will of course help us as users. I mean, we all make mistakes. The users will understand that unless we put up error messages like this. What am I supposed to do? Do I quit the app? Do I put it in the freezer? Do I throw, that, throw it out, call the fire department? I don't know, it's just scary. And it's catastrophical. And a pun if you like cats. <laughs> or messages like this bank app in Sweden. Helpful, very much. Do I still have an account? Where's my money? No. No. So let's talk about error messages and take the 404 page, the page not found, as an example, because we all come in contact with that one as well. Now, research has found that a poorly designed error message will give you a physical stress response by raising your cortisol level, your stress hormone. Physical stress response from bad software. I'm so fascinated by this and also a little bit scared because I know how software is usually written. I should not be allowed to write software. But what makes a good error message? Well, first of all, it uses plain language. And they sort of kind of are in this example, but I will not give them a point. Uh, contrast is not the best at this, uh, on this screen, so there is actually a cross over this, so they will not get a point for that. 
because even though they are using regular words, the words they are also using tech jargon that all users will not understand. So that can actually be a little bit scary or they can be a little bit hesitant about that. And a good error message is also actionable. No, no, they won't get that either. We have no buttons, we have no suggestions, we have nothing, no URL even. We should at least make sure that they have a way to restart or put in a search bar, something so they can continue with what they were trying to do. The message itself should also be short. And this is their first point. This is actually a short error message. Because reading one of those humongous error messages do not air, add to the clarity. And honestly, we don't read that much. I know at least one person who does that, and that's probably the only one, and that's my mom. She reads it all. But me, I would skim it. So it wouldn't help with the clarity of it. Explain how to fix it if it's fixable. We only get a lot of um, uncertainty here, I feel like. It might have been removed, it might have been renamed, it might be temporarily unavailable. What does that mean? Can I just press F5 and it will be there again? Will it take a week? I don't know. Sometimes, of course, we can't provide a solution, but we can provide options. Again, a URL to the start page, search button. Uh, if we have a shop, this is a prime this is, I don't know, the best place to put in things like our most popular sold items or things like that. Um, that will make the user feel like, well, it had an oopsie, but they're trying to help me. That's awesome. Let's buy this. So we will sell more and they will feel better about us and themselves because they will feel less like it's their fault, they made a oopsie. So, win-win. And I said it before, and I will probably say it again, never ever blame the user. Now, they're not directly blaming the user here, but they're not owning up to their mistakes either, because it's not the user's fault that we cannot cover 100% of everything that can go wrong. It is not. It might not be our fault either, but Definitely not the user's fault. And by using words like failed, error, even the color red here, will inadvertently put some blame on the user. So be humble about it instead. So let's look at another example. And as you might have known, noticed, uh, I like cats. So there will be a few cats. I also have cat stickers down here later. Uh, so, let's take this as an example. We are using plain language. It is actionable. We have, a provided, we have three provided um, URLs. It is short. We give a solution. They can choose from, from these URLs. And we are being humble about it. We're not blaming anyone. And you can be funny, you can be witty, you can be cocky even, you can be true to your brand, whatever that means for you. For me, it's a sad cat. As long as you also follow these five steps. So by doing these five steps, I think we've elevated the error message quite a bit. And again, just to be clear, this also applies to all types of error messages, not just a 404 page. It's just a good way to show the example. Being consistent and not reinventing the wheel, so to say, is also very good. Um, using uh, platform and industry standards will help the user to, with their learnability, basically. They will understand how to do it. Um, so I will ask you, what is this? What do you think this is? Any suggestion? Huh? A leaf. A leaf. Yes, I think so too. Good 
Nico, I think this is a leaf. So what would it do if it was a button? Not as easy, right? Yeah, I will tell you what it does. It creates a new message. Now I think or hope that it's a badly designed quill or it's like an eco-friendly indicator that we're at least not printing the papers. So this is from a learning management system in a school I teach at. It took me a while to actually find this because everywhere else in this system, they were using the pen. So I, it, it rendered it effectively invisible for, for a few, few moments. But all those moments adds up and all of a sudden we are really, really slow or at least perceived that way. And that's the problem with Create New. We have more than one standard. We have Twitter using a quill, a real quill, not a, not a leaf, and a plus. We have Outlook using a pen, we have stars, we have documents, we have so many different versions of this, which also will make it a little tiny bit more slower for us to actually find what we're looking for. Being this inconsistent will slow our users down. So if there is a standard for something, use it. That's really powerful. Now, these kind of straying a little bit too far from the standard and conventions also can be found in the real world. Are you supposed to pee here or wash your hands? Now for those who sit down, doing their business, this makes no sense at all. For those who stands up, trust me, there's been a few incidents. Because if you take the time to print a label for each and every sink or wash basin, I think someone made an oopsie here more than once. So yeah, standards are your friend. Probably seen, if you're a uh, local, you've probably seen uh, Signs like this, this is what it looks like in Sweden. Almost identical. I definitely feel that this is familiar. I know what's going to happen. This is what we want. Don't stray too far outside of um, standards, I would say. It's just a private road. Here's an example of an in-flight entertainment system. I go into uh, their game platform, I click a game, I play a little, the pause button is up here to the right. I get bored of this game, as one do. You go back again, choose another game, and I can't pause because there's no pause button up to the right until a minute later when I actually notice it's up here to the left. Same platform. So wandering elements like this we're creatures of habits. It will not be easy to find it. It will take us a little bit longer to find it. And again, you have probably figured this out. I'm impatient. We're talking a few hundred milliseconds to a couple of seconds, but a couple of seconds in, in today's software industry, that can make or break you. And you will make me rage quit. So there's that. Hierarchy is also very important for so many, many reasons. Um, for example, it will reduce that cognitive load we were talking about earlier. And as humans, we do not read pages, we scan them. And I know my husband in the audience is now hating on me because he has seen this image 500 million times probably. He still reads according to the hierarchy and it bugs him. Sorry, I outed you here. <laughs> but this makes hierarchy very important. We need to figure out what's the most important thing on the page. We need to figure out what's the least important thing on the page. Can we make that smaller? Can we remove it? Can we put it on another page? Here's an example of not optimal hierarchy, maybe. And because the screens are a little bit uh, blurred out here, I will increase the little bar that is actually, there is a little light gray divider here 
Um, what speaker is doing what talk? Did the divider help? No, not at all. So take an, let's take another example, a blog. So this is the first page. We have a subheader, we have a header, header, we have a bunch of subheaders, we have uh, preview text for all our posts. The first swing thing we can do to show hierarchy, well, the first thing we should do is actually use proximity so we know which header actually, which subheader uh, goes with what, so we don't do like the conference I just show you. So let's do that. We got a little bit extra space. And I've also increased the um, subheaders to be bold instead of uh, regular. They're same size, but they're bold because what I expect the users to do is just browse quickly, find one of the subheaders, click on it, and actually read um, the, the actual blog post. But we can now afford to move down the content from the kind of packed uh, up into uh, the header here. So let's do that. So other things we can do to show hierarchy here is, well, not all blog posts might have the same importance. So we can change that. We can do the prioritization for the users. We can put the most read one uh, or the most popular one, the latest one, what have you, whatever your priority is, we can put those up here. Because as a user, I will come to this page and I will know these four are the ones I should be really caring about. If I have time, I can also read the other ones. So let's click on a blog. And now I have another question for you. What is the least important thing on this page? There's no right or wrong answer here. Title. Title, thank you, yes, I think so too. Exactly, we know where we went. That's how I think as well. Yet every single time, we give it the largest space. We browsed it, we chose the 10th doctor, obviously we want to read about it. And also how many times do we think they will actually read the header while they're in here? Once, maybe twice? Tops. So I'm going to freestyle that to be a little bit smaller. Now just to be clear, I'm not saying all headers should be small. I'm saying in this case, I prefer it small because the content is more important. So it's not a one size fits all. But now it looks like the subheaders are super important. So let's change that as well. I mean, they are important, but not that much more important. So I'm actually, again, just making them bold in this case. We don't have to be more dramatic than this. Now, Lex had a great talk yesterday as well, so, uh, and talked about hierarchy, and uh, what I really liked is they talked about the um, spacing between different things. So again, if you did not see that one, check that out on YouTube when it's available. Uh, I'm doing this on PowerPoint, it's not the web, so it's a little bit more condensed. So the one on the right side, I, for me, it feels like the content um, is most, most important. That's something I will read. And the one on the left, the before, if you will, that has four, for me, in your face uh, elements that keeps grabbing my attention. I will probably read the header and the subheaders 10 times, all while trying to get through the text. Could be a me problem, of course, but this is also referred to as interference. If you are doing this for the web, we may need to make sure that we're still accessible. So the header, let's assume that's an H1. Do not choose an H4 because that's thinner and smaller. 
restyle the H1. This is super important because it will keep the context and the hierarchy for screen readers. So this is still an H1, I just restyled it. So speaking about accessibility, let's jump into that. WebAIM or Web Accessibility in Mind uh, have for multiple years done a uh, accessibility analysis of the top 1 million pages on the internet. How many, how many pages do we really have on the internet? But they have a lot of interesting data. And they are using uh, WCAG or Web Content Accessibility Guidelines to do these analysis. And that in, it, in itself has a range of accessibility enhancements we can do. Uh, everything from things like uh, visual, auditory, physical, speech. Uh, we have cognitive, language, neurological differences, what have you. It, of course, it doesn't cover 100%, but it does cover quite a bit. Now, the sad thing is that 97.4 of all the top 100 million, 100, no, 1 million, top 1 million pages, 97.4, that basically all of internet has accessibility issues. We are really bad at making web pages. The good thing is though, that almost 97% of those errors are within six categories. So if we concentrate on a handful of things, we can change the world, basically. So let's uh, dive into it. The most common one is low contrast. 86.4 pages have bad contrast. Again, that's basically all of internet. Now contrast is the perceived difference in luminance or brightness between two colors. We have a ratio that goes from one to one, that is white text on white or white background or black text on black background. And the maximum is 21 to one. So that would be pure black on pure white or vice versa. As a reference, red is four and blue is 8.6. Now there we have blue. Now we do have some minimum recommendations there. And the minimum recommendations for most of your text on your web page is four and a half. And you might be able to see why this is a minimum. Not very contrasty. I will personally recommend that you go all the way up to use the enhanced contrast recommendation, which is called AAA instead of AA, which starts at seven. So it's a little bit better. But the one I use the most is around 15, 16, because it's not, you know how you read pure white text on pure black background and the text will follow you a little bit? Yeah, uh, that will give you eye strain. So it's not that bad, but it's still a lot of contrast. So I like this one personally. So if you were between 15 and 16, that would be awesome. But please do not go under seven for most of your text. There's a lot of tools for checking contrast. There's um, basically, well, the largest at least, uh, browser developer tools. Sometimes they're a little bit hidden, but they're there. Uh, we have color.adobe.com, we have Contrast Checker, which is WebAIM. I have listed um, some of my favorites on my blog for you, and I will show you the link to that, and I will also tweet that out later with all the resources from today. So there's really good help we can get for this. Second most common accessibility issue, missing alt text on images. Almost two thirds of all the images on the web is of no use to a large group of people. That's a lot. And on top of that, sometimes we're a little bit pressed for time. We might be a little bit lazy. I don't know. You know the drill. So we put in, let's call them questionable alt text and using things like image or graphic or file name which is of no help at all. 
it's not that more difficult and it doesn't take that more time to actually put in a helpful alt text instead. Flat out lying, because this is what, what, what I will call it, flat out lying like this to pass some sort of, well, I'm accessible. That's just a slap in the face for those who actually depend on alt text. So please, please do not do that. And technology today is getting so good at interpreting what a picture actually contains. So in this case, for a little, a little over a year ago, this was interpreted as a parrot. Um, eh, well, it does have color. Today, it is interpreted as a cat wearing a garment. Closer, definitely. However, it's not as easy to translate or kind of um, interpret the context. This is a cat who wants to be a unicorn. That's important for the story. Doesn't help that much if we're just saying it wearing a garment. We need to provide an alt text for every single image we put on the web, even if it's empty. And I will show that in just a second. So let's take another cat, because you can't have too many cats in a presentation, as an example. We can show alt text in two ways. We can either put a text, a descriptive text, visible for everyone to see, close to the image. This is, this is good enough. Or, and, and or, we can uh, put it in our uh, image tag. Again, every single image should have an alt text, even if it's empty. So two things that I don't want you to do when it comes to alt text. Don't be redundant. Don't repeat the same information we have under here in the alt text. Choose another one. Or here is where you can leave it empty. If we are showing a text near to the image, we can leave this empty, but we do need it to be there. Don't include phrases like image of or graphics of because, or like in, in uh, this example, image of a white cat, because the interpreters or the screen readers will read image, image of a cat. So that's kind of redundant as well. So two things I do want you to do. Be accurate in representing both um, function and content of the image. In this example, we do not have a function. This is not a button. This does not lead anywhere. It's purely decorative. So uh, we only need to put in what it actually depicts. Um, for, for this story, it is important that it's sparkly and festive antlers. Be succinct without sacrificing accuracy. So that it's laying on a basket or that the pom-poms are red and green and all that does not add to the clarity. It's enough that it's festive, right? So let's get back to that shorter version instead. Third most common accessibility issue is form input labels. Now, we've already talked about how to elevate our form, so I won't jump into that rabbit hole too far uh, again. However, we need to make our code more accessible for forms as well, especially input stuff in our forms. So labeling all the things, that's what we need to do. And there's great resources for this, which again, I have uh, on my blog, uh, that web accessibility web accessibility initiative have come up with when in regards to label all these the correct way. We can actually label things without it showing on the screen if we don't want to. So you don't have to worry about that as well. So I promise you that uh, love hate, my favorite thing to hate when it comes to unnecessary step. So here goes. This is a real time report system. So I browse to the web page, I log in, and there's a 
button that says go directly to time report. Awesome. I like shortcuts. Let's click it. I'm asked to log in again. I just like, well, maybe there's no way to know on the web if I'm logged. No, that's not it. OK, let's move on. I, I, I log in again. Completely different page again. Now I need to click time report again. OK, so I click on time report. Guess what? I need to log in again. And now I can finally report my time. So I logged in here. And these have different designs and color schemes and layouts and everything. Now I like data. So I've timed this quite a few times. It takes about 16, 17 seconds on high speed internet. It should probably not take even a second, but let's say two seconds to be nice and also my math wouldn't work otherwise. So I'm wasting 15 seconds every time I go to report my time. Doesn't sound like much. You do know I'm impatient though. Adds up to almost a coffee break per month. Doesn't sound much, but that's for one employee in one system, one time. So let's say this is an internal tool and we're using that three times per day, that's fair, right? We're 200 employees. All of a sudden it's 600 man hours that we are just wasting. Now the companies are not realizing they are just wasting money on nothing. Well, not nothing, we do get angry frustrated employees, so there's that. But it doesn't always have to have, have focused on what I experience. Well, it is part of that as well. But they're losing money. They are getting frustrated employees who will probably quit at some point or another. And this is what you're going to say to that person who said, well, the customer doesn't see our internal tools. It doesn't matter. We don't want to put money on that. Yes, you do, because you will lose money. You're <laughs> basically bleeding money. And you will get that back. Maybe not in money, in measurable money, like gains, but you will gain so much other stuff. The staff will get more productive and will not rage quit. And talk smack about you on stage at a conference. So there's that. But if there is one thing I want you to take away from this presentation. Cliffhanger. It is that UX and accessibility shouldn't come as an afterthought at the end of, of your software development stage. And it should especially not be the feeling of, oh, right, I need to fix that for that accessibility issue for those types of disabilities. It should never be that. Because there are different ways to look at differences in, in um, functionality. If you're a new parent, you have a newborn, you actually only have one hand most of the day available. Um, if you have injured your arm, or in my case, my thumb, <laughs> you only have one arm available. So if you down put the prioritization way low for handheld navigation, because you think that your application will not be used by amputees, you are not only excluding the amputees, you are excluding a lot of people. So stop seeing it as a disability and start seeing it as a way to include more people. All the resources will be on my blog and I will also uh, tweet that. I do have stickers and we do have a couple of minutes for questions. If you are not comfortable asking it here, I will be around all day. Thank you so much. <laughs>